Good evening and welcome once again to another program of Issues in the News, where we discuss the important events that would have taken place in our country over the past week or so. Good evening and welcome. And I know that I have not been with you for about three weeks in succession because, regrettably, I was on the continent of Africa and then I was also in Barbados. And those overseas engagements kept me away from this program for, I believe, three successive weeks. But I am here now, and as usual, there are many important issues to discuss. I want to begin by, first of all, welcoming all of our viewers who are joining us on television in West Coast Barbice from Mahaika all the way along the Barbice River, all the way to Blairmont and further afield. Welcome to another program of Issues in the News. I also want to welcome our viewers who are joining us from the east bank of the Burbis River, all the way to Kanji, and then along the quarantine coast, upper quarantine, lower quarantine, and of course, all the way to Molson Creek. Good evening and welcome once again to another program of Issues in the News. To our friends who are joining us, on Facebook, on, sorry, on Freedom Radio, from Rob Street, Georgetown, welcome, and issues in the news. And last but not least, to the tens of thousands of you who are joining me on Facebook Live, right across the length and breadth of Guyana, the Caribbean, North America, Europe, Asia, Australia, New Zealand. Welcome to another program of Issues in the News. And I invite you once again to share this program. Share this program by pressing that share button on your phone or on your computer so that your friends, your followers can also join the audience and we can have the widest possible audience in our discussions tonight. So again, I invite you to share the program. I see Ganeshwar Narayan Sami, Kuldeep Sukhdeo, Bel C. Narayan, Gregory Hill, Ravi Jaichand, Patrick Sicharan, Nick Narayan, Ruki Debedin, Tis Yusankar, Rup Narayan Balram, Bobby Pasad, Darshanan Gobin, Martin, and so many of you who are joining us. Welcome on board and thank you for joining us this evening. And please press that share button on your phone so that we can invite your friends and your followers to be part of our discussions tonight. And I want to tell you up front that I will speak later on in the program on the CCJ ruling and the unfortunate incident that occurred in relation to that ruling. So I'm not going to shy away from that issue, but I want to deal with some other pressing issues of some importance before I get to that. So you have to wait a little, bear with me, and the suspense, I am sure, is going to worth your while, I have no doubt. So we have just completed grand Diwali celebrations in our country, countrywide celebrations. The government of Guyana, led by His Excellency, President Dr. Mohammed Irfan Ali, in pursuit of our one Guyana motto and national imperative, celebrated Diwali as a national festival, as we celebrate all other religious and cultural festivals, which form part of that kaleidoscope of festivities 
being part of our national agenda and national calendar. We are a people of six races, of different culture, from different religious background and rituals, and that is what make the Guyanese society a unique, multi multicultural, multi-ethnic, and multi-religious one. And the one Guyana principle and objective which we are pursuing as a government is intended to amalgamate, to merge, and to consolidate into one national list of calendar events, the various cultural festivities and religious festivities celebrated by the different ethnic groups of our country. Prominent among those festivals is, of course, the Festival of Diwali, which was celebrated, as I said, in grand style across the length and breadth of our country. We had beautiful motorcades in Essequibo, in Demerara, and of course, in the county of Barbies. And I want to take this opportunity to congratulate the Guyana Dharmic Sabha and my cabinet colleague and sister, Dr. Vindya Pasad, who leads that organization. And I want to congratulate her and her organization for organizing remarkable events surrounding this great festival of Diwali. They include stage shows, they include motorcades. I didn't get an opportunity to participate um, personally, but I participated from a distance by following the events. The floats were remarkable, they were spectacular, they presented the symbolism and significance of Diwali in their images that they projected and in the images that they depicted. I want to congratulate all the Mandirs and all the organizers and participants in those grand processes that made Diwali so successful and such a spectacular day also. So, the government of Guyana, through the Ministry of Governance and Parliamentary Affairs, Parliamentary Affairs held a grand consultation exercise at the Orta Chung Convention Center to discuss the amendments that are being proposed by the government to the Representation of the People Act and the National Registration Act. These electoral reforms were promised as a result of what we all witnessed during the March 2nd, 2020 election fiasco, which ended up lasting five to six long months. The call that came from the Guyanese electorate, from the diplomatic community, from 100 governments across the globe, from observer missions who observed those elections, and from various important stakeholder organizations, both nationally and internationally, was for actions to be taken against the miscreants, as well as for rehabilitative actions to be taken in respect of the process and the system, meaning the electoral system. The president made three promises. One, that the Guyana police force will launch an investigation into the allegations of wrongdoing with a view of instituting charges. If the evidence or the investigation lead destination the investigations have been completed and 30 odd criminal charges have been instituted and are in the criminal justice system. In the magistrate's court, I believe, most of them are pending. 
The President also promised a commission of inquiry to inquire into the questionable activities that caused a delay of the election results for a period of five months. We are all aware that that commission has been established by His Excellency the President. Work has already begun and hearings by that commission will begin shortly. The third promise that was made was for electoral reforms. We have made it very clear that these electoral reforms are going to be made in two stages. One, statutory reforms, and second, constitutional reforms. What we are engaged in, or what the engagement at the Arthur Chung Convention Center was about today related to statutory reforms, the reforms to the Representation of the People's Act, as well as the National Registration Act. It is already in the public domain that institutional reform bill has already been laid in the National Assembly and will be debated and passed earlier rather than later. And that bill will establish a constitutional reform commission, which will undertake the process of constitutional reform. This commission, as we promised in our manifesto, shall be a broad-based commission comprising of political parties in the National Assembly, 50% and 50% civic or civil society organizations. That is ill. When that printed, then begin the process of constitutional reform, and they must do so in a public consultative process. All those organizations who are making all sorts of noise and are criticizing the statutory reform process understand that they have to await the constitutional reform process to have constitutional issues addressed. And we have made that clear on numerous occasions. But these guys keep repeating the same thing. The type of political system that the country has, or the type of electoral system, is a matter for the Constitution. No statutory reform can change that. that the way GCOM is composed and the functional responsibility of GCOM are matters for the Constitution. Qualifications to vote and qualifications for registration to vote or registration on the National Register are matters of, for the Constitution. The way seats are calculated in proportion to votes cast is a matter for the Constitution. No single political party can endeavor to change those constitutional provisions because they all require a minimum of two-thirds majority, which none of the political parties singularly have in the National Assembly. So the constitutional reform process, sensual exercise, that will take time. That will take a process. These reforms, however, are of an immediate nature and can be implemented with every convenient speed. We have local government elections, and I'll speak about that shortly. These reforms must be completed or ought to be completed before the local government elections because they also apply to the local government electoral process or processes. I am not sure 
that the constitutional reform process can be completed before the next elections, which is scheduled to take place, all things being equal, in the year 2025. have to be implemented before that date. So, and we have explained this possibly a hundred times, but these organizations keep coming one after the other and expressing public condemnation of this process and public criticism of this process. And I don't wish to criticize them, except to voice the observation that many of these organizations are smaller than the average Guyanese family. The average Guyanese family has about six members. Some of these organizations do not have six members, and the ordinary Guyanese people do not know who those six members are if they are six members. We don't know what are the rules of these organizations. To whom do they answer? Whom do they represent? Now, I am part of a collective. I have my views, but my views have to be reconciled with the collective of which I am a part. The collective of which I am a part is the government of Guyana and the People's Progressive Party the largest political party representing the largest cross-section of Guyanese in this country. When we speak or we put forward a proposal, and the same applies to all other mass-based political parties, we represent a constituency. We are responsible to those people. We would have consulted with them. And then we come and we make public our position. These organizations don't have anybody to consult with. They don't consult with anybody. Two or three members constitute these organizations, and the views of those two or three members are then presented as the views of civil society. But they are invited, and their views are listened to, and their views have been taken on board. So this consultation that we concluded today lasted some hours, over five hours. We had more than a hundred persons in attendance representing various organizations, including political parties. And they were allowed to fully vent, ventilate the recommendations, suggestions, as far as time would permit. Importantly, this is the second iteration of consultations. You would recall that these proposals were made public a very long time ago, and we engaged in one round of consultations before, after inviting submissions from whoever wished to uh, provide submissions, and we invited those who decided to provide submissions and held discussions with them, and the submissions were taken on board. Changes were effected based upon those submissions. And then we have held today a second and hopefully a final round of consultation so that we can take the bill now to Parliament having the benefit of the contribution. And we had note takers there taking notes of the recommendations that were being made, and persons are free to submit to Minister Gail Teixeira, as she indicated, as she invited them to do, submit for the recommendations. We don't pretend that we have the, uh, all the answers, and that is why we are engaging in these consultations. We could have easily said that we have completed consultations, but we held a second round. And it was open, it was streamed live, it's on the DPI website, I'm told, it is on the Parliamentary of Governance website, I hope to get the video in due course, 
and put it in on my website, on my Facebook page as well. So it was streamed live so that there is transparency. There is nothing to hide. It was open. All persons who were there would have been on the screen and broadcast live. And their contributions would have been heard by everyone. Our contributions would have been heard by everyone. That is democracy at work. That is transparency at work. And that is the style of government that we promised and that is the style of government to which we are committed. So we completed that very important exercise today and I was invited by Mr. Shira to do the presentations and quite apart from the presentations, I tried as far as I possibly could have to explain the electoral system of Guyana, explain the law relevant elections, explain the constitutional processes relevant to elections, explain the role and functions of GCOM, explain the role and functions of the various officers in the electoral process, explain how the voters list is arrived at, explain why you can't scrap the voters list, explain why the, the system, explain the type of registration system that is ensconced in the statute and, and, and to then explain what the provisions are that we are proposing, the changes that we are proposing, what informed those changes, what were some of the mischiefs that we are attempting to address by these changes, why how they will improve the system, the type of penalties that will flow when there is a violation of these provisions or an abdication of responsibility imposed on law by certain uh, electoral officers. All of that, very comprehensive engagement, as I said. It lasted from about 1.30 until 5.30, four to five hours. Of, with a small break of 20 minutes. So I believe that it was a comprehensive undertaking and it was commendably participatory and the persons who were there behaved with decorum and civility and we had constructive exchanges. We didn't agree on all the views that were expressed we didn't agree on different interpretations of the law, but we disagreed with mutual respect and we explained why we disagree or why we agree with a particular position as opposed to another position. So we, we concluded that exercise. And the amendments now provided that we don't receive any additional comments. Those that were recorded today or taken down in writing today will then be examined and if they find acceptability, incorporate them into the current menu of statutory proposals and then we take them to Parliament. That's the next big step. So we consulted, we completed that exercise today. So let me visit the Facebook and see how you are engaging Jillian Lewis. Oh, somebody saying that I am sweaty. Well, I had a hard day, but that's the nature of the job. Gobin Mohan is watching. Shelley, Shelley, Shelley Mangru, Kyle Schofield. Jaya Lakshmi is watching. Yes, I'm a little um, hot and I'm a little sweaty, but that's, that's okay. It means that I'm working. I'm giving the taxpayers results for paying me the small salary that they're paying me. So, let's move on. Someone sent a video to me today, a 
as I was on my way from the convention center, the, Mr. Aubrey Norton is in the video. It appears to be a video of his press conference, which I know he conducts every Tuesday. And in the video, Mr. Norton chooses to speak about a poll. He, according to Mr. Norton, this poll was commissioned by the People's Progressive Party or the government. And the poll showed that if we are to go to an election, the APNU AFC will beat the PVP soundly at an elections. The reporter asked Mr. Norton, who did the poll? Mr. Norton says he can't refuse, he can't reveal it. What are the results of the poll? Mr. Norton says he can't reveal it. Why would you keep the results of a poll that shows that your party will win, a secret, Mr. Norton can't answer that question. The reporter asks why anybody would believe you. You are refusing to disclose all this information about this poll. He says if he discloses the information, he will get people in trouble. The reporter asks, asked him, well, if poll says that you will win the elections, and if you seem enthralled and very impressed by this poll, if that is so, of course he can't answer that question. No, which, nope, I don't know of any poll that was done, but I don't know which pollster can come to a conclusion. AFC, APNU, at this point in time or any time in the near future, is likely to beat the, PN, the PPP at any elections. This just invents. It's either that he invents these things or he is so gullible that anyone can concoct a lie, irrespective of how outrageous the lie may sound to an objective listener or bystander. He believes the lie. And what is worse, he regurgitates it publicly. And then wants to become abusive to the reporter when the reporter begins to ask, ask questions that a reasonable, prudent reporter would ask in the circumstances. That is what he does to all the reporters. He holds a press conference. He makes disclosures makes as usual some bites. They are completely without basis. They have, they do, they do not sound sensible. They are, I'm a facey, incredible. Naturally, a probing reporter or a competent reporter would probe. And when they decide to do that, he gets aggressive. He becomes confrontational with the reporters. Any one of his press conference, you would see that approach. He makes a disclosure, but no one was asking questions about it. No one can ask him any questions about what he says at a press conference. I don't know why he keeps a press conference. Why don't you issue a press statement where you say what you want to say in writing and you don't have to ask any, you, nobody has to ask you any questions. 
the irresponsible politician who decides to hold a press conference must feel questions in particular in relation to what you have said at the press conference, not this opposition leader. He says things at a press conference and becomes very offensive when he's interrogated about the very things that he expects the press to publish. He doesn't entertain any question and he becomes confrontational and becomes disrespectful of the reporters. So this obviously is a concoction of his, obviously, about some poll and <laughs> AP and U, AFC is ahead of the poll. AFC and AP and U, in my respectful view, is at their lowest ebb over the last 10 years, principally because of Mr. Norton and for other reasons, but he's one of the main reasons why they are at that low ebb. And this gentleman has persuaded himself that there is a poll out there that says should will defeat the government. Complete, complete delusion, if not a fabrication. In preparation, so I'm moving on. In preparation, for the local government elections, you are aware that GCOM has written to the Minister of Local Government to indicate their readiness and they have given a date or a time frame within which they can ready their machinery for elections. And based upon the information received from GCOM, the Honorable Minister of Local Government, my colleague, Mr. Nigel Dharamlal, forward upon him by the Local Authorities Elections Act, has appointed the date of 13th of March, 2023, as the date for local government elections. Potential Upon the appointment of that date comes certain statutory responsibilities of the Honorable Minister, which is that he must publish in the official gazette the various local authority organs that will be going to those elections, the number of constituencies in each, their respectful or respective boundaries, and other matters required in law in relation to the electoral process or processes. Publications under the hand of the minister been made already or are in the process of being made and are supposed to be or will be in the official gazette very shortly. After that, then the machinery to take us to local government election is kick-started and the preparations will begin to unfold. Of course, this is election season and this is an important factor in the democratic equation of any country. Local government, people believe, is not important but local governance and local government are of crucial importance, not only for the democracy of any country, but for grassroots representation, for governance at the level of the community. And it is that platform that allows the ordinary Guyanese to participate in the governance structure, playing a real and true part in the political
administrative management of local affairs within the legal structure. The process is intended to produce a local cadre of leadership, depending upon the political party to which one subscribes. We have different processes that produce this local cadre of leadership. Speaking from the perspective of the People's Progressive Party, it is a process that is driven from the bottom. So public consultation will produce the list of candidates. Of course, the party centrally sets some broad parameters, some broad guidelines, some broad principles, some broad criteria, some broad um, structures that is expected to be carried out or that are expected to be carried out. But largely, it is the people in the community who will be, in, who, who will be engaged and they will produce that cadre or leaders who will be contesting those elections. That is how we have done it historically. And from all indications, we are resorting to that mechanism this time around. So your party representatives and other persons will be in your communities and you hear the electoral preparations being discussed and being plans being unfolded, and you are, of course, invited to come on board. The opposition, as usual, is in a confused state. The AFC says that they will not contest elections. And then a few hours later, there seem to have been a change and another statement emanated to say that the executive of the party will have to make that decision. Then the APNU, they are also in a state of confusion. I believe the leader of the opposition is on public record as saying that he will not contest elections. He made one statement that they are not participating in the claims and objection process. Then I heard another statement that he is participating in a stronghold only. He distracted by the incompetence, by the confusion, by the ineptitude that is taking place in the opposition camp. That is characteristic of them. They can't get their act together, and that, as I said, is a normal process when it comes to anything. They can't get themselves together. So we are not, the population is not clear, but whether they boycott the elections, whether they participate in the elections, we know that they are going to get a beating. We also know that they know that they will get a beating. We also know that they are afraid, afraid of the elections because it will denude them all the talk, the fat talk that we are hearing. All the bad talk and the threats, the boasts. Judgment Day is coming very shortly. They are mortally afraid of that. Because what they will say after they receive the trashing is another will have on their political fortunes going forward realities that they don't wish to confront. Someone asked me what is the impact of the opposition boycotting the elections. 
answer the question by posing another question to the person who asked me the question. I said, if you and I are enrolled to write an examination, and for whatever reason, at the last moment, you chose not to turn up. I turned up, wrote the exam, and I passed. The fact that you chose not to turn up obviously can't affect the past grade that I would have gotten or affect my grade at all. So I believe that simple but simplistic answer clarifies the issue. Whether the APNU AFC contests the elections as a collective, or as individual parties, or whether they do not, will not affect the credibility of the elections, neither will it affect the legality of the elections. It will have devastating political consequences for those who chose not to participate. I distinctly recall that although Cherry Jagan knew and the PPP knew going to be rigged 1968, 1973, 1980, they knew that those elections were going to be rigged, but they never boycotted it. Jagan took the position of participating in the election. Always. And by that, by that position, he was able to demonstrate to the world, and the PPP was able to demonstrate to the world the magnitude of the rigging and the fraud that was perpetrated at each of those elections. Imagine the 1985 elections were so massively rigged by the PNC that the PPP got nine or eight seats out of 65 seats the PPP got. Imagine the level of the stealing and thiefing and rigging. And these fellows are still around and are still Using others of rigging elections, I tell you. We live in a very strange place. So, local government election preparations are on course, and you will be hearing more from the government on the matter in due course. So let me come now to the ruling by the Caribbean Court of Justice. Let me begin by speaking on the incident where there was an unauthorized disclosure of the results of the ruling based upon an advanced copy of the decision which was sent to all the parties. You all have read what happened, and you have heard what happened. I was on a plane to Barbados from Guyana when the post, when the email was received and when the post was made. When I arrived in Barbados, in the airport, I realized that the post was made, and I deleted the post. It, that post did not stay on my Facebook page for more than 10 minutes. It did not stay on my Facebook page for more than 10 minutes. The bottom line is that it should not have happened it was a breach of protocol at my end for which I accept and I accepted full responsibility. I 
I apologized. I was reprimanded and admonished by the Caribbean Court of Justice, and I accept my reprimand and admonition. I took my blows like a man. I did not throw anyone under the bus. And we have moved beyond that. I will write a letter to the court. I'm in the process of doing that to again personally offer my deepest and most sincere apologies for the transgression. As I said, the CCJ was right to reprimand me. The breach of protocol could not, should not have taken place, but it did. And I can't reverse that process. All I can do is to apologize. The other explanation which I owe members of the public is for my not appearing. I did not know that this issue was going to be a major issue in the judgment or else I would have made other arrangements to be there. I was in Barbados, engaged in a very high level meeting at the residence of the Honorable Prime Minister of Barbados. Very important matter, there was a delegation from Africa and from Europe and from Barbados and the meeting was at the same time that the case decision was being handed out. My non-appearance at the court hearing. But there are some facts which I should put out there. It is not intended to justify or to excuse what happened. What happened has happened and I accept responsibility. But the truth of the matter is that, as I said, the post did not stay on my page for more than 10 minutes, but it was photoshopped by a member of parliament, or it was replicated or posted, photoshopped from my page, and posted on a member of parliament of APNU AFC's page and kept there or possibly the entire night, and then reposted by supporters of that political party and shared widely. The sharing of it didn't come from me. And I realized what was happened from Barbados. I attempted to make contact with senior counsel, Mr. Royce Dale Ford, to explain to him that there was an unfortunate mistake and to try to get him to persuade his colleague MP to remove that posting from his page. I did not get to make contact with Mr. Ford by phone. I then informed Mr. Dave Kisu, another lawyer involved in the matter, I called Mr. Kisun and told Mr. Kisun I'm trying to get Mr. Ford on the phone and I am unable to do so. And I asked Mr. Kisun to make contact with Mr. Ford, to ask Mr. Ford to his colleague, MP, to remove the post. Mr. Kisun called me back to say that he made contact with Mr. Ford and Mr. Ford says that he will try. That's what was reported to me. I didn't speak to Mr. Ford. I spoke to Mr. Kemran Ramjatan, however, as he was a lawyer on record as well, and he is a leader of the party whose MP had that post on their page. I drew it to Mr. Ramjatan's attention. I explained to Mr. Ramjatan that it is an unfortunate error made that I was in flight and I'm now in Barbados and I'm asking him if he can persuade remove the post from his page. Mr. Ramjatan told me that he will try. Those matters out there and to say that the breach was committed at my end and I accept full responsibility. 
But I also thought that it is important that we explain the steps that were taken to get it out of the public domain and to state the facts in terms of who kept it in the public domain. Of course, the very persons who kept it in the public domain are the ones who went and complained to the court. But that's what under the bridge. But I just thought that I'll put that out there. But what is important is that the judgment was sent to everyone. It was nothing sent, nothing special treatment to the Attorney General. It was sent to all the parties at the same time. But there's the other important point that I want to put out there. And the third important point is that the outrage and the lamentation that you are hearing are not about the breach of protocol. It is because that they have comprehensively lost their elections petition. They, of course, by the error that occurred, it gave them an opportunity to sanctimoniously pass judgment upon me. So I became the platform for them to vent their frustration. But their frustration had nothing to do with no breach of protocol. It is because they were soundly and wrongly beaten. What their frustration is. Because they went out there and they made promises and made all kinds of declarative statements about removing the PPP by this and what was posted on my page, Facebook page the night before the judgment was delivered, really and truly you are aware that I said that one year and a half ago. When they filed the appeal to the Court of Appeal a year and a half or so ago, I said that the Court of Appeal has no jurisdiction and, they, they, and that they will eventually lose the case. I didn't say that the night before the judgment. I said that one and a half years ago. Because that is the law. So I wanted to make that very clear. And I heard a someone interviewing Mr. Norton somewhere and asking him what disciplinary process they will take against me. These people are delusional. Norton has no disciplinary powers over me. What they should consider, considering the lawyer or those who had responsibility to serve the petition within the legal time frame and that put them in this problem. That person should be disciplined. Me, you're going to discipline? I won the case all right through. Investigate and interrogate the facts and circumstances which led to the non-service of the matter are no other than Mr. David Granger. And permit me to say, that the ruling of the CCJ has concluded the litigation course in respect of that petition. Finally, I heard all sorts of arguments that this case can go to some other court. Let me clarify that all five judges who sat said that the Court of Appeal had no jurisdiction. And that was the issue that was before the CCG. We appealed the decision of the Court of Appeal. The Court of Appeal ruled that it had jurisdiction. We filed an appeal against that singular ruling 
to say that the Court of Appeal does not have jurisdiction. And five judges, all five of them, unanimously upheld our appeal. That the Court of Appeal doesn't have jurisdiction. This is what the court determined. The judges expressed a view as to where the appeal should go. That view is called in law obiter dicta. The binding effect of a case is called the ratio decidendi. And the ratio decidendi of the ruling of the Caribbean Court of Justice in that petition is that the Court of Appeal does not have jurisdiction to hear and determine an appeal in this case. What was said by those two judges, as I said, is what is called obiter dicta. It is an aside. Judges did not offer that view. And the entire court said, irrespective of the view of those two judges, the case does not, doesn't meet the threshold for them, for them to even reconsider whether they will send it to some other court. The court, three judges have made the decision, and that's the end of the matter, that the Court of Appeal has no jurisdiction. Well, all five have said so. Two others made some obiter dicta pronouncements. Obiter dicta, any lawyer of reasonable competence, no, let me rephrase that. Law students, first year law students, will tell you that an obiter dicta statement of a judge has no legal binding effect. It is said as an, it's a judge expressing a, a view. I say that to say that any attempt to litigate this case elsewhere, as I heard some arguments in that direction, will be an abuse of the process. It will violate a principle called res judicata, meaning that a matter has already been pronounced upon by the highest court. So it would be res judicata. It would be abuse of process in my view. And secondly, because of those reasons, it will be lost again. It will be lost again. And I'm not breaching any protocol by saying so. I am expressing my view of the law based upon my understanding of the law. So let us see. I heard all the big talk about, you know, what will happen and how this will happen and how that will happen. Petition is dead. I also heard the effect that the Commission of Inquiry should not go ahead with its business, because somehow it collides with the election's petition. There is no election petition. That one is finished. And that is the one that challenged the electoral process. That is the one that would have had some conflict, if any at all, with the COI. That one is now concluded. It's completely lost. It's not in the system anymore. So the Commission of Inquiry can go ahead and do its work. The other elections petition only raises the question of the legality of Order 60 under which the recount was done. That is the issue that that election petition raises, that is still in the system, whether the recount was done under order, whether the order 60 under, the re, under which the recount was done was a lawful order. That is what I understand that election petition raises. It doesn't say anything about valid votes, nothing like that. It talks about the legality of that order. So for all, and that's purely a question of law. So for all intent and purpose, the elections petition is finished. The real election petition, that's finished. Um, 
So there is no connection anymore. There is no basis upon which the, 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 the COI, there is no connection. I don't understand the connection and the, 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 the pronouncement that we have a, 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 an election petition pending and this thing will collide with the election petition. The election petition is finished now. This one that is in the system, as I said, deals with a pure matter of law. And express my view again on how this one will, 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 how this one will conclude. I think I may have done so already. They have lost in the High Court. And let us see how the Court of Appeal will rule. And then we have to go to the CCJ if it becomes necessary. So I thought that I will speak on those matters and put them to rest once and for all and to remind viewers what I said when the elections petition were filed. Remember, Mr. Harmon was the leader at the time. There was a big gathering in front of the High Court and the elections petition were filed and there was a big announcement that these elections petition will put the PPP out of government in six months' time. <laughs> but in six months, both elections petition were thrown out of the High Court. And two years later, one received death at the, court of, at the Caribbean Court of Justice, and the other one is on its way. The other one is on its way. And where is the PPP? in government. So, brothers and sisters, I thank you very much for being with me. I hope that I have shed some light on the issues that are of importance and that are currently um, occupying your attention. And I also wanted to deal with this issue of the CCJ. And as I, I want to close to reiterate my contrition, my apologies, I reiterate that, I apologize to the Guyanese people as well, if I didn't do that before. And to say that it is human to err, I have erred, or an error was made, and it makes you refocus, refocus. It recalibrates you, it makes you become less complacent. If I was becoming complacent, or those around me were becoming complacent, and it re-energize you to refocus and to continue the work of the government and of the people of Guyana. I thank you very much for spending the past hour with me. I think we have had a good program, and I'll see you. Thank you very much, and please enjoy the rest of the evening. Thank you.